Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the EKG case for the week of July 9th, 2012. This week's case was brought to us by Dr. Larry Rainey, who's down in South Carolina at the University of South Carolina. It's an emergency physician that I've known for a number of years and has provided me some very, very nice cases. This was a 42-year-old man who presented to his emergency department with shortness of breath and weakness. And I'll tell you right up front, Larry got this case right, but I think a lot of people would have gotten it wrong. And so I thought it was a great case to share with everyone. This is the 12 lead EKG that the patient presented with, with this shortness of breath and weakness. Now, we've traditionally learned that when you see a wide complex tachycardia, and this certainly is a wide complex tachycardia, the first, second, and third thing that you're supposed to think of is ventricular tachycardia. And you give the patient lidocaine, amiodarone, procainamide, whatever it is that you normally want to do with your VTAC kind of patients. What's a bit unusual about this case, however, is that it's not just a regular wide complex tachycardia. It's something that I refer to as an R R W C T. In other words, there's two R's in there. It's not just a regular wide complex tachycardia. What does that extra R stand for? I th I like to say that this is a regular, really wide complex tachycardia. That's what the extra R is for. All right. And if you look carefully, you don't even have to look that carefully, but you notice that this is not just a regular wide complex tachycardia. It's, well, as the initials say, it's really, really wide. When you see QRS complexes <clears throat> that are that wide, I mean, these QRS complexes are more than 200 milliseconds, more than one big box wide. When you see that the QRS complexes are really wide, then... I'm going to ask you to stop for a second and put ventricular tachycardia down the list, maybe to number two on your list instead of number one. And when you see these really wide QRS complexes in these tachycardias, I really think that you need to think about tox and metabolic causes. And that's exactly what this patient has. This patient had severe hyperkalemia. I don't remember the exact number, but I think it was up in the eights as Larry had told me, uh, 8.0, um, normal for those international listeners, normal hyperkal rather normal potassium levels ought to be, I don't know, 3.5 up to maybe about 5, uh, I think, milligrams per deciliter is the units we're using. And so when somebody's got up to 8, that's life-threatening. If I had a potassium of 8, I would have been dead a long time ago. And I think maybe this patient had a history of renal failure and so maybe could tolerate this uh, level of hyperkalemia. But the key simple point that I want to leave you with here is when you see QRS complexes that are really wide, don't initially think of ventricular tachycardia. Consider the possibility of tox or metabolic problems. So RRWCT, really wide complex tachycardia. Think tox or metabolic causes first. And when you see those really wide complexes, think about giving some empiric calcium and bicarb first rather than the usual antiarrhythmics, rather than the usual lidocaine, amiodarone, procainamide, whatever your usual antiarrhythmics are. Why is that? Well, if you're dealing with hyperkalemia, hyperkalemia poisons sodium channels. And remember what lidocaine, amiodarone, and procainamide are. They're all sodium channel blockers in and of themselves. You can really wipe out those sodium channels and put the patient into asystole. That's been published before, and unfortunately, we've learned that the hard way as well. And, and I'll show you some cases, but if the first thing you're reaching for is your antiarrhythmic, you're going to really hurt the patient. And remember, the first law of medicine, primum no kill them, okay? You don't want to kill these patients. That's really, really bad. You don't want to hurt these patients. So just try some empiric calcium and bicarb. And what if it does turn out to be true ventricular tachycardia and you mistakenly gave them some calcium or you mistakenly gave them some uh, bicarb, one or two amps of bicarb, you know what, it's not going to hurt. It's not going to cause any major problems at all. It'll just pass through the system relatively quickly. But every now and then, in fact, oftentimes with these really wide complex tachycardias, you give them the empiric calcium, you give them the bicarb, you see the QRS narrow, you know what, you've got your diagnosis and you just saved somebody's life. Let me show you a couple cases where unfortunately we learned this the hard way 
Here's another, this is a regular, really wide complex tachycardia, and I'm giving you the answer here right up front. This patient's hyperkalemic to 9.2. Unfortunately, the physicians that were taking care of this patient didn't know that the potassium was 9.2. What they saw was this fairly regular, really wide complex tachycardia. Now, in all fairness, it's not completely monomorphic going all the way across, but traditional teaching, when you see something that's wide complex tachycardia, you're supposed to think ventricular tachycardia first, and what these physicians chose to do was they gave the patient some amiodarone, the patient went right into asystole and died and could not be resuscitated. Uh, for obvious reasons, the physicians that sent this case to me chose uh, or asked that I not put their names in this case, but anyway, the key thing here, once again, it's not just a regular wide complex tachycardia, it's a regular really wide complex tachycardia. There's two, I guess the really is actually the second R there. Uh, so regular really wide complex tachycardia. If you look carefully, take a look at how wide these QRS complexes are. They're more than a big box wide. Those, that's, it's really wide. <laughs> and so this is not just ventricular tachycardia. The first thing you do when you think of this is calcium and sodium bicarbonate. And if they had done that in this particular case, the calcium would have stabilized the myocardium, the bicarb would have shrunk the QRS, and they would have had their diagnosis. If calcium bicarb didn't do anything to this EKG, then sure, go ahead and call it ventricular tachycardia and use your, your usual medications. Now, I mentioned that uh, you should think about tox or metabolic. In addition to hyperkalemia, overdoses of sodium channel blockers can produce this pattern. Uh, severe acidosis can produce a wide complex rhythm as well. Here's a nice example. Here's a patient that for whatever re reason was severely acidotic. Maybe it was really bad sepsis. And you'll notice once again, there's a regular really wide complex tachycardia. The rate's here about 110, 115, which by the way is a little bit slow for true ventricular tachycardia, but whatever. It's fast and it's wide, but not only is it wide, it's really wide. Take a look at how wide those QRS complexes are. You have to say, you have to agree, that's really wide, okay? So regular, really wide complex tachycardia. This patient's chugging along, pseudo-stable for about an hour, and then they finally got the 12 lead EKG and said, oh my gosh, it's regular, it's wide, this must be ventricular tachycardia. They gave the patient some amiodarone, and the patient went right into a PEA arrest and also could not be resuscitated. Maybe that would have been the outcome anyway, but the key point here that I really, once again, want to leave you with is when it's regular and really wide complex tachycardia, think about tox, think about metabolic problems like hyperkalemia or severe acidosis, and when you see that RRWCT, you give some calcium, you give some bicarbonate, you're going to save a life, all right? So, simple pearl that can save a life. I hope that was helpful. And uh, again, RRWCT, think tox, think metabolic. I hope that was helpful, and I look forward to talking to you next week. Until then, take care.